Within our institution, there was a desire to commemorate the centennial anniversary of the suffrage movement. So we were able to work together and over the course of about three months, develop this tour that really highlights the stories and artwork of the suffrage movement that we have inside the Capitol building. For the centennial, it was an absolute pleasure to be able to form this program. I really wanted to focus on the stories of the other women who contributed, and I really wanted to talk about those women of color and their personal struggles and how the movement wouldn't have happened without them. I think it was important to me to tell the story of women in a place where visually we see a lot of pictures and statues of men. We kind of try to impart on all tours, not just this, that we are tomorrow's history. And we each, every day that we wake up, we have a chance to make history, just like they did. Ladies and gentlemen, I stand before you having been accused of, tried for, and found guilty of the alleged crime of voting in a presidential election when I had no legal right to do so. I submit that I not only committed no crime, but was merely exercising my citizens' rights, and it shall be my purpose here today to explain to you why it was within my rights and why we should make sure that the laws are adjusted to make sure no woman ever gets arrested for such an activity again. Now I know what you're thinking, where did I get these ideas that women should have equal rights with men? Well, all I can say is I can't really help it. I was raised that way. I think the circumstances of my birth were very fortunate and I don't mean to imply that we were wealthy in any way. No, I was very fortunate to be born into a Quaker household where we were taught that the inner light of God shines equally in all of his creations, whether you are male or female, black or white, or rich or poor, and to disrespect any person is to disrespect the creator. So it has been our intention to treat people with love equally whenever we encounter them. The boys and the girls in my household had equal opportunities to participate in conversations around the table and to do their schooling. We first learned to read with my grandmother. But when I was about six years of age, my father was given the opportunity to manage a, a textile mill just across the state line in New York State in, in Battenville. And while I was there, was the first time that I had to see what it was like to be among people who were not raised with those convictions. I was sent to a school with other children of the town. And I remember very clearly a day when the girls were sitting in the back practicing their penmanship while the boys were in the front doing something with numbers that looked fascinating. It was not generally thought that girls needed to learn much beyond simple sums and reading and writing. And then we would have to go home and learn how to do all of the domestic arts, of course. But in school, I saw this wonderful array of numbers and I scooted my chair closer and closer until I could get close enough to one, one boy and say, what, what are you learning? What is the teacher doing up there? And he said, it's called long division. And I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. Well, just about that time, the teacher spotted me, reprimanded me, sent me to the back of the room and said, long division is not for girls, Susan. Go back and work on your penmanship. Well, when I told my father that story after school that day, he did something that amazed me and impressed me and set me on the course of life that I continue to follow to this day. He built a schoolhouse of his own on the mill grounds where the boys and girls could learn as equals, where the children of the textile workers could also get their education, and where the textile workers themselves could come in the evening if they wanted to continue their educations. And I took two lessons away from that great deed of my father's. One was, he impressed upon me that education is very important, and you must not allow small obstacles to interfere with your obtaining one. And the other lesson was that if you see an injustice in the world, 
You must do what you can to fix it. Even if the injustice does not afflict you directly, and I will give you some examples in a moment. I had the opportunity to continue my education at Miss Molson's Select Female Seminary out just outside of Philadelphia. I was hoping I would be able to be sent to Emma Willard's uh, Seminary for Girls in Troy, New York. Um, you know Mrs. Willard, she was really ahead of her time. And the girls were taught all of the same courses that the boys were taught. They learned Latin and Greek and science and all of those wonderful things. Why, when the girls were seen coming to school with potatoes and turnips, the men in the town looked at each other and said, well, they're finally teaching those girls something practical. Maybe they'll learn how to make some food now. And in fact, those vegetables were so the girls could carve spheres and cones for their solid geometry lessons. And when Mrs. Willard put a diagram of the human circulatory system on the board, oh, some parents were so scandalized, they took their daughters right out of that school. But many stayed in and continued on and became teachers and very inspiring women themselves. However, I was sent to Miss Molson's, where my sister Guelma had already preceded me a year earlier. But in 1838, as a result of the depression that was afflicting the nation at that time, we were called home. My father's mill was going into bankruptcy and they could no longer afford our school fees. So home we went and when I arrived, I saw that all of the household objects were being auctioned off to settle the debts, including many items that belonged to my mother. Things that she had brought with her from her childhood, her own eyeglasses. And I asked, why are mother's things being sold? And that was when it was explained to me that according to the law, a married woman could have no property of her own. Any property that she had before the marriage became the property of her husband. Any property that she acquired during the marriage became the property of her husband. Any earnings, any inheritance, all became the property of her husband. A woman could not sign a contract, could not sue in a court of law, could not execute a will. But I was appalled to learn that women had no more rights than children and imbeciles. A woman had no more rights than, than someone in chattel slavery. And I thought, well, here is a wrong that needs to be corrected. So I joined with other people and we wrote letters to the New York State Legislature asking them to change the property laws for married women. Of course, they were laughed right out the door, but we continued. How many times had we heard terrible tales of a, of a worker drinking away his wage packet on a Friday and then going home and beating their wives when she complained that there was no money to buy food for the children? What is a woman to do if she has no rights or property of her own? How can she leave an abusive husband? What mother would leave her children with an abusive father? For indeed, it was also understood by the law that in the event of a divorce, the children would belong to the father. So we tried an additional approach. In addition to trying to improve the laws for married women, we thought perhaps we could also do some good by taking alcohol out of the hands of the men. And there you see was an example of a problem that didn't afflict us or our family. We were teetotalers, it still are, None of us was going to get beaten up by a drunken husband, but I saw this terrible wrong happening all around me and thought, I must do what I can to help correct it. So I became a member of a temperance society. And that's where I first learned about meetings and organizing and speaking and other tools that would be useful to me for the rest of my life. You know, it was unheard of for a woman to speak in public if it was a group of women and men. So some people used to come to my, to my rallies just to see the sheer novelty of a woman speaking in public. However, I was teaching at the time um, when my parents moved west along the Erie Canal to Rochester, New York, after the textile mill had failed. And they were living in a farm outside of Rochester. And Rochester was a town of very forward thinking and progressive individuals. And my parents' home was the site of many meetings of many interesting people. I was able to meet Frederick Douglass and Wendell Phillips and William Lloyd Garrison. As a matter of fact, 
Mr. Garrison asked me to be the state agent for the New York State Anti-Slavery Society. Yes, I became very active in the fight against slavery. Now around this time, a woman who would become one of my dearest, well, truly my dearest friend, had gone to London to participate in an international anti-slavery convention. She went on her honeymoon. I'm speaking, of course, of Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She and Mr. Stanton went to London on their honeymoon in order to participate in this convention, along with Lucretia Mott, a wonderful Quaker woman that I admire. And the women were not permitted to be seated with the delegates, even though they had been duly appointed as delegates from the American Anti-Slavery Society. While well, they saw the proceedings going on, without their participation, they thought, perhaps there is something to be said for promoting women's rights as well. And after they came home in 1848, they organized the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York, where they wrote and read the Declaration of Rights and Sentiments that began all men and women are created equal and put as one of its points that women should have the right to vote. That was a very controversial notion. I was not able to attend that, alas, as I was teaching at the time, but my parents and my sisters attended a similar convention in Rochester the next week and told me all about it. It was a few years later that I was brought to Seneca Falls to participate in a temperance society meeting. And there I met up with my friend, Amelia Bloomer. You remember Mrs. Bloomer, she's the one who thought we should really dress in a more practical way. And she started wearing these kind of wide Turkish trousers with the skirt above them. And I did try them for a while and they were so practical and very comfortable. But I found when I went out to speak in those, I would be laughed at to such a degree that I thought I'd better stay with more conventional dress so people would listen to what I'm saying instead of talking about what I'm wearing. However, it was there that I was introduced to Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and we liked each other immediately. We knew that we had similar ideals, similar principles, and we're both willing to dedicate our lives to these causes. Now, I will say that while the temperance fight was important to us, abolitionism had to take the higher role. We needed to exterminate the hideous stain of chattel slavery from our country. It, it was the most cruel and unusual institution that we could think of. So we became members of the American Anti-Slavery Society and we, we supported the struggles of the Union Army in whichever way we could with, with uh, raising donations and providing materials. And when the war was over and after the Emancipation Proclamation was written and after the 13th Amendment was ratified that said neither slavery nor involuntary serv servitude shall be permitted in the United States or in any state, we thought now it is the woman's turn. And so we started what we called the American Equal Rights Association. And the American Equal Rights Association was dedicated to the idea that the freed slaves male and female, as well as all of the women who were already being denied the vote, should have equal rights. Now, when the 14th Amendment to the Constitution was written, you remember it, I'm sure, it said that all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens thereof and of the state in which they reside. Let me say that again, all persons born or naturalized in the United States. So I have to ask all of you, are women persons? I think they are. I think most of you agree that they are. So that means that I am a citizen of the United States, something I already thought, by the way, especially every time I had to pay my taxes. However, <clears throat> the 15th Amendment which was written primarily to ensure that the freed slaves could safely cast their ballots. This was our opportunity to make sure that women were given the same rights. The 15th Amendment read, the right to vote shall not be denied by the United States or by any state because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But there were two words that were left out to my mind, or sex. 
shall not be denied because of race or sex. This made us very unhappy. And women bolted from the American Equal Rights Association and we hastened to form the National Woman Suffrage Association. We were so disappointed that the abolitionist men, including some of the freed slaves, Frederick Douglass, an escaped slave himself, who had stood by us through, through all of our conventions and all of our meetings, how they could turn their backs on us at this point. Oh, Mr. Douglas said, now is the Negro's hour, the women must wait their turn, but we were tired of waiting. And so now we are in the National Women's Suffrage Association. Mrs. Stanton and I, as the president and vice president, I'm the one who gets out more, Mrs. Stanton has many children, so I often go visit her in Seneca Falls, where I can be of whatever help to her I can. Her husband once said, oh, I see, um, Susan stirs the soup so Elizabeth can write the words, so Susan can go out and stir up the country. And that's what we've been doing now for many, many years. We wrote to our congressional representatives. We wrote to our state legislatures. We wrote to the president. We signed petitions. We had meetings, we had conventions, we wrote to the newspapers, we talked to people as I am talking to you today to express that it is a simple logical sense that women should have the full rights of citizenship in this country. But we got tired of waiting. And so we began what we called the new departure. No more asking. We are going to work under the assumption that we already have the right to vote. And how do we know that? Well, all persons born or naturalized are citizens of the United States. I'm a person. And the right to vote should not be denied or abridged on account of race. Well, I have a race and you cannot deny me the right to vote because of that. So in 1872, I made sure I spent enough time in Rochester to satisfy the residency requirement. And my sisters and I and our neighbors went down to the barbershop where voter registration was, was taking place. What makes you think you have the right to vote? We were asked. So I read them the Constitution. I read them the 14th Amendment about how all persons born or naturalized in the United States, they agreed that I was a person. And I said, a citizen's right to vote shall not be denied or abridged because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And they looked at each other with bewilderment, and they said, well, I, I guess we will, we will let you register. I think that they believe we would never have the gumption to show up and actually vote on election day. But show up we did, good and early, before there could be too much of a scene. And when I arrived, the uh, judges of election said, what makes you think you have the right to vote? And I said, well, first of all, I'm registered. You can see our names right there. And second of all, I read them the Constitution. And I explained to them that I am a citizen, I am a person, and I have the right to vote. And with some strain on their part, they shrugged their shoulders and said, well, I, I suppose we need to let her vote. And we voted. It was delightful. I thought this was so easy. Why didn't we try this years ago? And then I went home and I waited. And it didn't take too many days later that a knock came on the door and a young man who was standing there in his long coat and his beaver hat paid for no doubt with our tax dollars said, um, Miss Anthony, I'm, I'm obliged to take you uh, downtown to Commissioner Storr's office. Commissioner Storr's was the commissioner of elections. And I said, well, for what purpose? And he said, well, you're to be arrested. And I said, is this how you usually arrest people? And he said, oh, no, no, no. I, I usually come and I, and I put handcuffs or irons on them and, I, and I, take them, I take them to the courthouse that way. And I say, well, put on handcuffs. I do not intend to be treated any differently than anybody else. Well, he declined the handcuffs, but I said, give me a moment. And I ran upstairs, grabbed my alligator bag filled with leaflets and said, let us go. And when we got to the streetcar, he paid my fare. And I said, are you paying my fare because I'm a woman or as part of your duties in this case? And he said, oh, no, I am required to pay the fare of those that we apprehend. And I said, well, that's the fir first five cents worth I ever got out of Uncle Sam.
And I started handing out pamphlets while I was on the streetcar, and I said, look, I'm being arrested for voting. I want everyone to see how a citizen is treated when she exercises her right to vote. Well, it was quite a scene, as you might imagine. Now, when I was taken to the courthouse and the charges were read against me, I recognized this courthouse. This was a place where runaway slaves who had been captured had to await their return to their horrible lives in the South. And I thought, whatever is going to come to me could be as nothing compared to the dreadfulness that they had to face in their poor, pitiful lives. So I steeled myself to take whatever would come next. Well, while I was uh, awaiting trial, I went about speaking. I spoke in every town in Monroe County, which caused the prosecutor to say, oh gracious, well, you have to move this now to Ontario County because we can't possibly get an impartial jury here in Monroe County. They've already been persuaded by Miss Anthony. So the trial was held in Ontario County at the Canandaigua Courthouse, where Judge Ward Hunt was sent to preside. And he was already a notorious opponent of women's suffrage, so I did not have very high expectations for the outcome of this trial. The first thing he said was that I was not permitted to testify. He said women were not competent to testify in a court of law. I don't know who could possibly be more competent to testify as to my activities and my reasons for doing them than I myself, but I was not permitted to testify. However, I was in the good hands of my lawyer, Henry Selden, who argued much as I had, that if you read the Constitution clearly, surely women were included in the right to vote. Well, after all the arguing was done from one side and the other, the judge turned to the jury, all men, of course, and said, gentlemen of the jury, I thank you for your service. I hereby direct you to return a verdict of guilty. Well, who ever heard of such a thing? Well, they were happy to return the verdict of guilty and leave and go home to their families. I think they'd been very uncomfortable the whole time. And then the judge said, before I pronounce sentence, does the defendant have anything to say? Well, you can imagine having been muzzled for the whole trial, I leapt to my feet and said, oh yes, your honor, I have a great many things to say. With your directed verdict of guilty, you have trampled underfoot every vital principle of this government. My legal rights, my natural rights, my political rights, my civic rights are all alike ignored. With your directed verdict of guilty, you have degraded my status from that of a citizen to that of a subject and not just myself alone, but all members of my sex are to be subjected in that way in this so-called government. Well, he finally hit the gavel enough times to get me to stop. I had gone on quite a while at that point and said, I hereby fine the defendant $100. I said, Your Honor, I will never pay a penny of your unjust fine, and I never have, and I never will. I was hoping this case would go all the way to the Supreme Court, but he allowed it just to ride instead of allowing me to derive any more beneficial publicity during this fight. Now, as it happened, the same year, a woman named Virginia Minor attempted to register to vote in St. Louis, Missouri, and she was denied. So her husband sued on her behalf because, of course, a woman was not legally entitled to sue in a court of law. But he did sue on her behalf, sued the election commissioner, and that case did go all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the case of Minor v. Hepperset, the Supreme Court held that citizenship does not automatically confer the right to vote, but that it was up to each state to decide how it was going to be allotted. And I was horrified to hear this. I said, once we have the false notion that citizenship does not include the right to vote, there is no end to petty freaks and insidious devices that will be used to deprive one group or another from their suffrage. And that is indeed what happened. The dearly won rights that the freed slaves were enjoying were all too quickly taken away with poll taxes and literacy tests and all kinds of nonsense. But now it was clear to us that nothing would do but another amendment to the Constitution.
And so it is my purpose now to engage your help in seeing that Congress shall write and pass a 16th amendment to the Constitution that will say the right of a citizen to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And if you are joining me in that cause, I will be circulating petitions and I will encourage you to write letters, and I encourage you ladies who are here alone to talk to your husbands because power is never given away easily by those who possess it. I thank you very much for listening to me today, and with your help, I am sure that failure is impossible. The following program was produced by the United States Courts. Virginia Minor, a pioneering advocate in the march to the 19th Amendment, opened the doors for women's right to vote. Mary Beth Tinker, a pioneering 13-year-old Vietnam War protester, set the standard for free speech rights in school. While their times and passions are 100 years apart, they are linked in the legal history of St. Louis. Each woman lost her court case there, but both persisted all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. On their way, they had an impact on their contemporaries, their communities, and ultimately, on the Constitution. Virginia Minor is an example of the power of grassroots organizing, of navigating the legal systems and advocating for real change, not only in her own community, but change that would have resulted in huge ramifications for the entire nation. St. Louis was a site of strategy sessions and conventions where Virginia Minor and Susan B. Anthony organized the early suffrage movement. They publish these resolutions, as they called them, in Susan B. Anthony's newspaper. The revolution was the voice of the movement. It issued a call to action that women, as citizens, already had the right to vote under the 14th Amendment, which established birthright citizenship and equal protection of the laws. They say, basically, like, dear women, you have already been granted the right to vote because of the 14th Amendment. You're guaranteed the right to vote. Go take it. Virginia Minor did just that. She tried to register to vote in the presidential election of 1872, but the St. Louis voter registrar, Reese Happerset, turned her away. Miner's action made national news. She and her husband sued and lost. They appealed and lost again. So they took her case to the Supreme Court of the United States. In 1875, the justices unanimously rejected Miner's claim. Citizenship did not give everyone the right to vote. So the initial strategy was to sort of test the limits of the law and navigate within the existing legal system. They did that and it didn't work, but they didn't give up. Virginia Minor and Susan B. Anthony did not live to see the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. They never got to vote, but by working inside the legal system, they set the stage for victory. Their determination inspired another generation of change makers. This is a human rights issue that is going on all over the world. Mary Beth Tinker is a student rights activist who talks civics and civility with students in classrooms and courtrooms around the country. In the 1960s, Tinker and other students wore black armbands to school to protest the Vietnam War. The school suspended them. The students sued, claiming the school district violated their First Amendment rights. Small action by ordinary people is what makes history usually. And that means that young people and kids, 13-year-olds like I was, can make a difference by speaking up and standing up about things that you care about. Like Virginia Miner's voting rights case, Mary Beth Tinker's student speech case went to the Supreme Court. But in the end, the Supreme Court said, no, the kids were right. When I talk to young people, I tell them that when you speak up and stand up about something you care about to make a better world, you don't always win, but it's a great way of life, trying. It was actually a really nice experience meeting Mary Beth Tinker. We did go over her case in school. Being able to speak freely about what you care about is just something that's really important. I have a voice too. 
Some people did walk out during class, though. Isn't that right? The third yes. branch of government is very important for our democracy, and it's important for young people to pay attention and to get involved and follow it. There are so many cases that I like to tell students about as I travel around the country that are going to affect their lives. From generation to generation, Americans ask the federal courts to clarify the Constitution, and we the people accept those decisions, win or lose. That's because we agree to follow the rule of law as a vital part of maintaining our democracy. And as long as there are ordinary people like Virginia, Mary Beth, and you, our democracy will be strengthened by every generation. I think as a young African American, there's four or five names by the time you're six or seven years of age that are in your mind. And one of them, without question, is Rosa Parks. My parents were traveling through the South during this time period, and my mother was thirsty and wanted water. Very simple, just wanted water. My dad said he pulled over to a diner. The person that met them at the door said, sure, we'll give her water, but she's going to have to come around to the back. This is the type of things that were going on. They experienced all of this personally. Those kinds of things. That's what she was tired of. Tired of just ignoring it and saying no. No more. No more of this. And then to see her be able to stand up by sitting down mm -hmm. and say no more. 